A while back, I posted a video about Sahih al-Bukhari 3320, a hadith in which Muhammad says that if a fly falls into your drink, you should dip it all the way into your drink and then take it out. He says that the reason for this is that there's disease on one of the wings and there's the cure for that disease on the other wing. My video featured me discussing this with ChatGPT who said there is no scientific basis for this. Uh, in general, if something falls into your drink, it's usually best to get a new one. However, in the comments of that video, Muslims were defending this, saying that there were studies showing that dipping flies into your drinks can reduce bacterial growth or something. And I said, that is fascinating. Please send me that link. And they did. And I read those studies and I was like, I just have to make a video about this. For some background, the Hadith are the second most authoritative text in Islam, the Quran obviously being the most authoritative. And they provide context for many of the teachings in the Quran. For example, the Quran contains the command to pray, but the Hadith explain exactly how to pray, how Muhammad prayed. In fact, pretty much every Islamic ritual is defined in the Hadith rather than the Quran. And there are differing levels of authenticity that is attributed to each Hadith, but the one we're discussing today has the highest authenticity according to most Muslims. The majority consider this to be the most authentic Hadith, and some have said this is the soundest book of narration after the Quran. So if there is a scientific error within this highly credible Hadith, that presents a big problem for Muslims. At the end of this video, I'll show you how some Muslims deal with this scientific error, including some who just throw up their hands and say, yeah, we can't really defend it. <laughs> but first, let's take a closer look at this Hadith that we're talking about here. So Sahih al-Bikari 3320 says, quote, The Prophet said, if a housefly falls in the drink of any one of you, he should dip it in the drink and take it out. For one of its wings has a disease and the other has the cure for the disease. Now, obviously, this goes against everything we know about science and disease vectors and how flies contribute to transmitting diseases. And scientific studies have shown that flies can cause food contamination and carry pathogens which can cause serious infections. But what about those studies that some Muslims say confirm this hadith? There are two that I was able to find. Let's take a look at each of them and see how they hold up. The first one I was sent was titled, The Right Wing of Fly as a Neutralization of Drinks Contaminated by Microbe. And right as I started reading the abstract, one thing really stood out. It starts off by saying, Rasulullah Shalahu, I'm going to mispronounce this really bad. Uh, Alaihi Wasalam said, if a fly falls in the vessel, any one of you, let him dip all of it in the vessel and then throw it away. For in one of its wings has the ailment and the other has the cure. So in the very first sentence of the study, we have religious language being used and the actual hadith being quoted. This immediately hurts the credibility of this study in my eyes. And it's not just that it's a, an Islamic study or something like that. Even if this was a Christian study and they started off by quoting Bible verses, I would have a problem with that. I would say, I want you to be as objective as possible because I don't want the study to be skewed in the favor of Christianity. I want the study to be objective because I truly believe that Christianity is in line with obje objective reality. Therefore, we don't need to twist studies and be biased and things like that. But the problems with this study don't end there. So the way they did the study was they had a positive control of distilled water, then they had a negative control of E. coli contaminated water, and then they had their test water where they contaminated it with E. coli and then they placed differing levels of right wings of flies into it which is a sentence I never thought I would say. <laughs> Already, this brings up other questions. For example, why the right wing? Why not the left wing? If you remember, the Hadith we're discussing right now didn't mention anything about a left wing or a right wing having the cure or the disease. So that's weird. Uh, but what's even weirder is the result of this study. So they conclude the abstract by saying, quote, the data which we obtained for 48 hours incubation show zero as the result. That cannot be analyzed with SPSS. The result indicates the microbial development does not occur on contaminated drinks by addition with right wing of Musca domestica. So essentially what they're saying is there was zero microbial growth in the water that was treated with the right wing of the fly. So they put the right wing into the contaminated water and the microorganisms did not develop at all. There was no spread of the E. coli. This result just plainly does not make sense because even if the right wing of a fly does have antimicrobial properties, the E. coli would still grow at some rate. It wouldn't be zero. But the most suspicious thing about the results isn't even that. It's that they didn't give the results for the other controlled glasses of water. If you remember, this included three samples. One of them was contaminated with E. coli. That was the negative control. The other one was the positive control, which was just distilled water that they didn't put anything in. And then they had this water that they would contaminate with E. coli and then put the right wing of the fly into. They only gave us the results for the one in which they put the right wing of the fly. They didn't give us the results for the control. So the results could have been exactly the same for the control because of some other flaw in the study, and we just would never know that. The entire point of having a control in the first place is to show that what you actually did to this sample, in this case, putting the right wing of the fly into the sample, 
actually had the effect rather than some other cause that also affected the other samples. This is why, for example, in medical studies, they have different groups of people taking different medicines. Some of them take a placebo, some take no medicine, and the other ones take the medicine that they're actually testing so that they can see, is the medicine that we're giving to this group of people having an effect on them that is different from the other groups of people that are not re receiving this medicine? But not giving the results of the control is defeating the whole purpose of the study. So this study is just not credible for several reasons that we've just talked about. The religious language, quoting a hadith in the actual abstract of the study itself is highly suspect, and the results don't make any sense. But I came across another study that also claims that dipping a fly into your drink will reduce the amount of microorganisms in your drink. This one is titled, The Effect of Natural Falling and Dipping of Housefly on the Microbial Contamination of Water and Milk. And according to the authors of this study, they found that dipping a housefly three times into your water or milk reduces the amount of bacteria that develops afterwards. Dipping the fly one time reduces it, but not as much as dipping it three times, and not dipping it at all, just letting the fly fall into your drink and then taking it out, that leads to the most amount of bacteria in your drink, thus clearly showing that dipping the fly in your drink reduces the amount of bacteria. Therefore, Muhammad was right, right? Eh. First of all, let's just try to interpret this as charitably as possible, and if we were to accept that these results are credible, and yes, dipping the fly three times actually does something positive, Muhammad would still be wrong because he told you to dip the fly once and then throw it out. So if Muhammad said to dip the fly once and then take it out, but actually dipping the fly three times is much better, as this study suggests, then Muhammad was wrong about this. But as it turns out, it's even worse than that because this study, just like the last one, is not very credible at all. Similar to the last study we just looked at, the results just don't make sense. Because according to the methods section of this study, they use sterile water and sterile milk, and then they drop the fly into the water or milk. Then in another sample, they would dip the fly once, and in another, they would dip it three times. The ones where it was dipped three times had the least amount of bacterial growth, and the one that was just not dipped at all, just dropped in there, uh, had the most bacterial growth. But there was still bacterial growth in all of them. And it doesn't make sense that a fly which is carrying bacteria, as all studies show flies carry bacteria and other pathogens, if it were to be fully submerged in a drink, that is just going to release more of those pathogens into your drink. Whereas a fly briefly falling into a drink and being taken out, it's going to have less time to release those pathogens into your drink. And even worse, it contradicts the other study we were just talking about. Remember the other study we just talked about, the right wing of the fly stopped the growth of bacteria altogether. And in this study, it didn't stop it altogether. It still proceeded just at a slower pace. So either this study or that study or both are wrong, but they obviously can't both be true. One or both of them has to be either flawed or manipulated in some way. Now look, flies falling into water and what effect that has on the water is not a mystery. There's been many studies on this before. For example, a Belgian study on water towers found a batch test was performed to examine the effect of flies on microbial drinking water quality. After seven days, opportunistic pathogens such as, these are all bacteria, I'm just not able to pronounce it, <laughs> were detected in samples with flies. So yeah, when flies fall into water, it contaminates the water. That's, that's what all of the credible science shows us. And despite the best efforts of these highly suspect scientific papers, this hadith is clearly shown to be false. There's a scientific error in the hadith. There's no way around it. So how do Muslims get around this? How do they reason their way out of this? Does this create a problem for Islam? Is Islam now proven false because of this? There are a few ways to get around this, but whichever one you take, Muslims are left in a tough spot. If you're still watching this video, that means you're probably enjoying it. Or you're driving, you don't want to mess with your phone to change it, but you're like, dang it, I'm tired of hearing this video. I really want to change it, but I'm driving and I can't. It's one of those situations. But if you are enjoying this video and you're not driving, then please make sure to like this video and subscribe. It really does help. And if you wanna help me continue to make videos like this so that we can get the truth of Jesus Christ out to the world, then you can support the channel by going to the link in the description for Sarah's Cafe, where you can become a member and get access to exclusive videos that nobody else will ever see. And you also get early access to videos with no ads. You could also check out the merchandise that I'm selling below or any of the sponsors that are linked in the description. Those are also great ways to support the channel. Thank you so much. The first way around this is to say, well, this hadith just isn't legitimate. Maybe Sahih al-Bukhari is not a legitimate hadith. Muhammad never said this, therefore we don't have to worry about it. And some Muslims do take this way out because Shiite Muslims, for example, don't believe in Sahih al-Bukhari as a legitimate hadith. So they could just say, well, that's not a true hadith, so we don't have to worry about it. However, the vast majority of Muslims are Sunni Muslims, and Sunni Muslims pretty much have to accept that this hadith is legitimate. So for most Muslims, this is not going to work unless they're going to make the switch to become a Shia Muslim. But if you don't want to do that, then another way out of this is to say that, yes, Sahih al-Bukhari is reliable. Muhammad did say this, but it was just a metaphor. Don't worry about it. 
I've seen some take this approach, but the problem is that the early Muslims and uh, Muslim scholars up until very recently have all thought that this is a literal hadith, that, that Muhammad is not speaking metaphorically here. So if you're going to reinterpret things to be metaphorical as soon as they're proven scientifically false, it kind of shows that your beliefs are arbitrary. Even when Muslim scholars in the past have been challenged on this hadith, they didn't respond by saying this was a metaphor, they responded by saying, shut up. <laughs> For example, the Islamic scholar Al-Khattabi wrote, someone who has no righteousness in him says with regard to this tradition, how is this and how do a cause of disease and its remedy happen to exist in the two wings of a fly? How does the fly know that so as to advance the wing containing the cause of disease and to hold back the one containing the remedy? And what leads, to, what leads it to do that? These are the questions of an ignorant person. So he basically just goes on to insult the people that are crit criticizing this hadith. And he basically says that God just intended this as a trial of faith and that's why he made it this way to test our faith or something. But he doesn't go to the metaphorical explanation. He doesn't say, well, it's just a metaphor, guys, relax. He says, no, this is true. And even if we can't understand it, even if it doesn't make logical sense and we can't prove it, we're just gonna believe it anyways because God made reality confusing as possible and, and unclear as possible. And he told us things that seemed to be false so that he could test our faith is basically what Al-Khattabi is saying here. So to deviate from all of historical scholarship in Islam and just say, well, it's a metaphor and we don't have to worry about it. It, like I said, it seems arbitrary. It seems like you're just making things up as you go to fit what the scientific evidence shows rather than just acknowledging that there might be a scientific error in your hadith. There's a level of intellectual dishonesty to that approach that I think is going to lose a lot of people's respect. But the last way you could get out of this, which I think is the most reasonable way, is to just say, yeah, Muhammad was wrong about that. That is the most reasonable approach to this, I think. But I don't think Muslims really can say that Muhammad made a mistake because as the Islamic Center for Research and Academics says, it is widely accepted in Muslim scholarship that any statement made by the messenger of Allah that he had not subsequently retracted or corrected is considered factually accurate, even if it pertains to a field like medicine, which is not within the primary domain of prophethood. So within Islam, it is widely believed that even on areas that are not theologically related, Muhammad is 100% infallible. So if he's wrong about this, that shakes the very core of a lot of Muslims' beliefs. Some have started to change this way of thinking and say actually Muhammad could be flawed in some ways, could be wrong about some things that are not theologically related, but most I don't think are going to go that way. Instead, instead of taking any of these ways out that I've just detailed, what I've seen mostly from Muslims online is just to say, yeah, we, we can't really defend this one, we don't really know how to explain it, but um, we're just gonna believe it anyways. Now this hadith was widely accepted by the Muslims because this is something from the unseen and we believe in the Quran, we believe in the Sunnah. If we look at the, the miracles in the Quran and Sunnah, we will find that like 95% of them are proven through science today. I'll assume the 5% that science did not prove to be true as well because we have a track record now, this is in fact not true, and even prominent Islamic apologists will say that scientific miracles in the Quran have been disproven and that they can really no longer use those as arguments. I, one of the reasons I accepted Islam was the scientific miracles. I'll be honest with you. And now we know that this whole scientific miracles was absolute nonsense, not to in total. But guess what? Allah led me to Islam. One of the reasons was because of the scientific miracles. And guess what? Did I leave Islam when this whole scientific miracle thing got debunked? No. So even according to prominent Muslim apologists, scientific miracles are not all that common in the Quran. In fact, the vast majority of them have been disproven according to Ali Dawah himself. And this is just another example of a scientific error in the Islamic texts. And the reason that Muslims put up with this is because there is this understanding in Islam. There's a theological backdrop by which they believe even if things appear not to be in line with what the Quran or what the Hadith say, that is because Allah is testing their faith. It's because God has made it this way so that he would test their faith. And so if they're going to go with what their senses detect over what the Quran or Hadith say, then they are proven to be non-believers and therefore uh, they have no faith. And this is just so alien to us as Christians because we obviously understand that God created our senses to better understand the world around us. And what we have revealed in our scriptures is in line with reality as we can observe it, as we can prove it, as we can demonstrate it using our senses, using the scientific method, uh, using logic. God isn't playing games with us. He's not telling us things are one way while everything seems to suggest the opposite. The foundational philosophical assumption of science is that the universe is intelligible. We can understand it. We can predict how it will behave. We can predict how certain things will behave. 
given certain circumstances. Therefore, we can do science. We can invent things and create medicines, technologies, all this great stuff, because God created us with a rational soul that can understand the world around it. So under the theological assumptions of Islam, that God might create things in a way that contradicts the Quran so that he can test your faith or something, the theological foundations of Christianity say that the more you learn about the world, the more that God's truth will be confirmed. The more you learn about the world, the more that the scriptures will be confirmed. Because what God has revealed to us is in line with the creation that he has created. So if you're a Muslim or you're looking into Islam and you're comparing different religions perhaps, I highly recommend you go with the religion that aligns with reality and not one that forces you to reject certain things about reality even though your eyes and senses can plainly see that something is this way, you have to accept the opposite of that because of what your holy texts tell you. And Christianity has a rich history of intellectual advancements. For example, the man who discovered that the Big Bang Theory was the true origin of the universe was a Catholic priest. Thomas Aquinas, the world-renowned philosopher and theologian, a Catholic. Gregor Mendel, the father of modern genetics, a Catholic monk. All of these advancements are possible within Christianity because we understand that the way our senses tell us the world is, is trustworthy. Anyways, I'm rambling at this point and uh, I should probably go. So hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. There are no flies in my drink, so cheers.